Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Direct Pay, What It Means for Solar and Storage Developers. I'm Carly Batten, Director of Marketing at Clean Capital, and I first want to thank you for joining us today. We're here to provide an overview of direct pay, what it is, how we expect it to move the clean energy industry forward, its status in Congress, and what you can do to help move it forward. Just a couple of notes before we begin. First, this webinar is being recorded, and it is going to also be rebroadcast as an episode of the Experts Only podcast. So look out for that and check out some of our other great conversations there about clean energy, innovation, and finance. The recording will be available upon request after today's session concludes. Please ask questions at any time throughout the session using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. All of our questions will be addressed at the end. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, my colleagues at Clean Capital, John Powers, co-founder and president, who will serve as moderator for today's conversation. Melinda Baglio, our chief investment officer and general counsel. We're also joined today by Shannon Banyaga from the Partnership for Clean Energy Investment. Chris Maffey, head of federal policy and business development at STEM Incorporated. And Joshua Barabo, vice president of finance and corporate treasury at Amoresco. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. Carly, thanks so much. And thanks so much for everyone for joining. Um, as Carly said, my name is John Powers. I'm the president and co-founder of Clean Capital. But one of the reasons I wanted to put this webinar on today, in my previous role, I've sat in Washington on the other side of the table from advocates who've come in to talk about moving, uh, moving an agenda forward. And there's nothing more powerful than someone who comes from uh, not an industry group, or a lobbying firm, but who is actually in the states doing the work. And what we're having this webinar today is to help drive you to action to help move forward a critical piece of the clean energy agenda, which is the 100% direct pay. So if you think about the role that uh, tax policy has played in our energy policy, it's significant. So in 2007, the Energy Security Act was passed by George Bush in a bipartisan way, it included the uh, uptick in the investment tax credit for solar and the PTC for wind. That has been an unbelievable economic boost to our industry and has helped drive us forward to where we are today, where the fundamentals of our industry are, are strong and we are, you know, have really grown as a, as a marketplace. What many of us have seen that are on the deal side is there continues to be a challenge right now between demand of projects and supply of tax equity. And one of the solutions for that is this concept of 100% direct pay. So today we're going to walk through what that is, how it's going to affect deals, how it's going to affect you as developers and other folks that are in the audience, and then really what you can do about it. Because really our ask today is not just to understand what's going on, but to take some action and help us push this over the goal line so we can take two, 2022 and beyond and really continue to accelerate the market. So I'm going to start with Shannon, uh, who's from the Partnership for Clean Energy um, in, Investment. So first, Shannon, what is the Partnership for Clean Energy Investment? Thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. So the Partnership for Clean Energy Investment is a coalition of a broad base of stakeholders united in support of advocating for that one single issue you just described, 100% direct pay. It's our view that this one mechanism will truly be a game changer on America's ability to unlock infrastructure investment, unleash economic growth, and deliver on the climate and clean energy goals that we have. Further, we take a, a very holistic view of direct pay. Um, if an entity is qualified to receive a clean energy tax credit, 100% direct pay should be offered as an option for that entity to use. You know, the reason why we take that view is that we are going to need absolutely all of these clean energy technologies to meet our goals here. Absolutely. Um, so for folks that aren't familiar, can you, well, first of all, the reason this, the, the coalition is so important is a lot of us are part of industry groups that are in Washington pushing the clean energy agenda, but they have a whole plethora of things that they're asking for. The importance of the coalition is it's very focused on one specific ask and educating members and their staff on the importance of that ask. So just so people understand, can you talk about what 100% direct pay is? Absolutely. Um, so 100% direct pay, and, and maybe I'll, I'll take a step back and expand a bit on the membership as, as you kind of teased out there. Um, one of the things that was really important to us, as you, you noted, this isn't to replicate a, a trade organization. Um, these trades are really, really valuable in everyone's different industries. 
but they also have a, a variety of uh, priorities, frankly, that they've got to get across. So the, the development of this coalition um, and the diversity of membership for this coalition was really important to us because, you know, our ability to put more clean energy projects in the ground affects every community, right? So, you know, we are we're comprised of the, a variety of stakeholders, developers such as yourself, utilities, public power, think tanks, trade groups, and others. In addition, we're working alongside a lot of the environmental NGOs here in Washington, energy purchasers, and other supply chain industries to really nail the nail the point about 100% direct pay. Um, so. So the 100% direct pay option works as an alternative to the current tax equity system that puts tax credits directly into action, improving our power system the way that Congress really intended. The tax equity system will continue to exist and thrive. <laughs> so for, for any financial institutions out there, this is not you know, a, a death knell at all um, for those that choose to utilize it. But under direct pay, entities that are eligible to receive clean energy tax credits, such as the ITC or PTC, which we've touched on, would receive the equivalent funds directly rather than a tax credit that either has to be you know, monetized later or in some instances like nonprofits and public power can never be monetized because they don't have sufficient tax liability to do so. So one of the reasons this is so important is that as I, as I mentioned, we're expanding the, the variety of clean energy technologies necessary to, to meet our clean energy and, and climate goals here. You know, as Congress expands that pool of recipients for PTC and ICC, the tax equity market is equally flooded with proposals from, you know, across the entire clean energy spectrum, storage, solar, hydro, biofuels, hydrogen, carbon capture, uh, transmission. I could, I could probably go on for, for too long here. You know, it's really important that you know, we offer all the tools that we possibly can to, to make the most efficient gains here on our clean energy goals. In Chan, it's important for the audience to understand that we're not saying direct pay versus an IPC extension, correct. right? This is this is together. It's an additional tool in our toolkit, correct? Absolutely. We're not undercutting the value of these other priorities, such as the extension of other federal you know, tax credits or storage ITC. But what we are saying, you know, those those things will suffer the same fate as what we've experienced so far, right? An inability for developers to really monetize the development that Congress intended. Um, you know, the finance community, I think, recognizes the constraints here. Uh, you know, I think one of the stats that came out um, late last year from Bloomberg was, you know, 59% of solar projects and 67% of wind projects that were scheduled to start construction in 2020 going into this year were still in need of tax equity financing. You know, Marshall Salen over at Citigroup uh, noted in an S&P article recently that there's never been enough you know, tax equity dollars to supply all of the good projects. So this isn't a reflection on, on you know, due diligence or, or anything. It's just a, a matter of, you know, this constraint and the way that direct pay would really present clean energy developers with a more efficient means of financing these projects. And it, and it doesn't rely on the financial institutions weighing out their own tax liability before engaging with those developers at the end of the day. And for folks that are for, regarding the, the partnership, are you guys still accepting members? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I know we'll we'll touch on a bit later, but you know we are we are definitely in crunch time right now. Uh, the next you know three weeks are, are a very crucial moment in our advocacy. Uh, we're accepting members. Happy to happy to reach out to anyone that's interested. I know we'll put up our uh, contact information at the end of the webinar here. And here's my used car salesman pitch. It's no cost to you. So you can join the <laughs> membership and, and influence what's going on. So Absolutely. Melinda, I want to talk for a second about what the 100% tax equity, 100% um, uh, direct pay does for driving efficiency, changing economics, driving innovation, um, and really you know, driving equality for the industry. Can you talk for a second about what clean capital is first and then talk about how we, this will affect financing projects? Absolutely, John. Thanks for the intro. Um, and thank you, Carly. Um, so just a quick intro on Clean Capital. Clean Capital is an energy, a clean energy investment platform. We focus on the uh, middle market clean energy technology. So um, solar projects ranging from under a megawatt up to maybe 20, 25 megawatts um, that we then aggregate together into attractive financing and investment portfolios. 
Um, we, uh, we've been around since about 2016, um, and we've in that time deployed about $850 million in acquisitions for uh, operating and new build solar projects. Um, I think what kind of distinguishes clean capital from, from a lot of uh, uh, companies out there that do similar work is our, um, our ability to work quickly and efficiently. Um, we uh, have partnered with a number of uh, developers um, and clean energy sellers to, uh, to, build to build our portfolio pretty quickly over the last several years. Um, I think we've closed four transactions in 2021, whatever year we're in, 2021. Um, and we're now in, I think we've acquired assets in over 19 states or in 19 states. Um, so we've got a lot of experience kind of working across, you know, several different jurisdictions. So, um, so that's kind of clean capital in a nutshell. Um, getting into tax equity, um, I want to piggyback on some of the some of the things that Shannon mentioned in her presentation. So just taking a step back, she she sort of mentioned this is going to be like a quick tax equity 101, how it works, right? So she mentioned that a lot of folks are not able to monetize the tax credits that come in the form of the PTC or the ITC because they don't have the tax liability. Um, and so what, what happens is they wind up partnering with a bank or a corporate entity that does have the tax, ap uh, tax appetite to monetize the tax credits. Um, and you wind up having another um, financing party that's part of your deal. Um, so as you're building up your capital stack, you've got your sponsor equity, your tax equity, and then typically you'll have debt on top of that as well. Um, and that's how folks have been able to actually monetize the tax credits when they don't have their own tax liability. Um, you can imagine that that leads to a lot of complexity, just adding another third party financing entity into the mix. Um, you've got multiple parties doing the same due diligence. You're paying multiple law firms to do the same due diligence. You've got a separate set of financing documents. Um, so it can get pretty messy, pretty complex, you know, pretty quickly, just having that extra layer on there. Um, it also, uh, it caps the amount of debt that you can raise on your project because you've got this tax equity partnership in between your projects and your debt. Um, you have less cash available to pay debt service. So you're not able to leverage the projects as much as you might otherwise. Um, so, you know, it, it's a it's a great system. It's, um, you know, we've got some great partners that we've worked with on third party tax equity, but it does add complexities to the process. Um, and for us in particular, when, you, when you're looking at these smaller projects in the CNI space where, where clean capital really excels, um, you know, the, the more you layer on additional um, um, costs for diligence and legal fees, um, it, you know, you feel it a lot more. Um, the other big issue is on timing. So when you're bringing in a third party tax equity investor, you need to have them come into the deal before the, before the project is actually operational. Um, so going back to what you said, John, about how you can't always find the tax equity financing when you need it. Um, this happens year after year. In the beginning of the year, you've got this, you know, these great projects. And particularly if like clean capital, you've got kind of smaller projects. You need to aggregate those to a size that that then becomes attractive to third party tax equity, which is you know where we excel, but we see a lot of developers struggle with. Um, but you may struggle to find tax equity early on in the year. At the end of the year, a lot of times you have folks raising their hand and saying, "Oh, wait, I have you know I have extra availability this year." But by then, it's probably too late because you've either decided to scrap the project or you've you know kind of found a different path forward. Um, so there's timing issues that come up that that also lead to a lot of uncertainty um, when you're dealing with a third party tax equity provider. Um, so I think that's sort of the the background here on the on the challenges of our current system. Getting into direct pay, obviously, it's less complex because you won't have um, that third party tax equity provider. You won't need to bring in a third party tax equity provider. Um, typically, the way I, I've seen these deals structured um, back when we had direct pay, you know, 10 years or so ago, um, the, the, the cash grant program that, um, that was in place, typically these deals are structured with you've got your one senior lender. Um, you don't have third party tax equity, but you may have a tax equity bridge loan or sorry, a tax credit. We used to call them cash grant bridge loans. I guess they'd be called direct pay bridge loans or whatever we decide to call it um, uh, once we get direct pay implemented, fingers crossed. Um, but it would usually come from your same financing party. So you're still just working with one uh, kind of set of lenders and one, um, one set of uh, legal on the lender and financing party diligence side. 
Um, so that's on the complexity of the legal structure. From a commercial perspective, it's great. You can raise more debt on these projects. Um, and typically you can, as a developer, earn a higher developer fee um, by you know, removing this additional uh, piece of the capital stack. Let and when you, for instance, when you work with Clean Capital, you, we'll handle all the capital stack side for you. But I think the key from what Melinda's laying out is it's gonna bring efficiency uh, to the transactions, and it's also going to bring ec better economics to, to to everybody at the table, including the developers. So, you know, it's a really exciting path uh, to help really get more projects in the ground more quickly. Um, I want to go next. You know, Melinda talked about the efficiency and economics. I want to talk for a second about innovation and equality and what direct pay can do for that. And I'm going to turn to Josh. You know, Josh Amoresco is working nationwide and. Uh, with developers and developing your own projects. Can you talk for a second about uh, what Amoresco does? Sure, yeah, so thanks for having us, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Amoresco is a leading clean tech solutions integrator. Um, we are a Republic company. We were founded in 2000. We have just about a billion in sales um, and, uh, and, and pretty healthy profit margins. We have a portfolio of over 300 megawatts of energy assets that we've developed and uh, currently own and operate. It's a, a little bit heavily skewed, a little bit more heavily skewed towards solar, but we have um, almost 100 megawatts of biogas assets on the portfolio as well. Um, we have some wind and we have some, some standalone battery storage too. We operate in North America as well as the UK. And um, back to our energy asset portfolio, we have almost um, uh, over, also over 300 megawatts of a similar mix of biogas and solar battery and what we call energy as a service assets in construction or in development. And while we're an asset owner and asset developer, we're also um, what's called an energy efficiency or ESCO company, where uh, we serve primarily government, municipal and federal government customers, as well as CNI customers to do um, some pretty deep energy retro retrofits, things uh, as sophisticated and advanced as advanced building controls, microgrids, um, and again, distributed generations I've talked about, as well as things that aren't so uh, exciting, but certainly help save our customers money uh, in terms of uh, water savings and electricity savings, lights, motors, drives, um, shower heads, things like that. Um, so, so that's, that's Amoresco. Um, I think the question yeah. was about innovation. Um, yeah, so, let, me, let me frame it up. If, okay, if, you, sorry. if you think about, no, it's okay. If you think about the market today, there is a, there's more demand uh, then there is supply of tax equity. So a, a tax equity provider, mm -hmm. right, really has to choose between possibly a vanilla solar project or a more complex project that, in, that involves a variety of innovations. How will direct pay really help move the innovation side forward? Well, well, so I think it, there's there's two things. It's not only just complexity uh, in terms of the technology, if you're adding battery to solar, or if there's some other nuance to maybe the revenue piece of it, um, if you've got multiple off takers, or if you're in uh, what I believe are some confusing state regimes that have just variable net metering credits and there's recalculations and things like that. Um, but also just project size. Um, it's, it's to your point, a, a one, a small asset portfolio takes just about the same amount of, we'll call it legal expense, diligence, headaches, paperwork as a project's 10X or 100X that size. And so in an environment where there's limited, limited um, human capacity at a tax equity firm, uh, these, the, the majority of tax equity is sourced from very large multinational banks who have hundreds of thousands of employees, but the tax equity group is actually very small. Um, if they only have a small team of a few people to deploy X number of billions per year, they're going to have to chase where the highest returns are on their time. They can't direct five people to do a million dollar deal. They need to direct those same five people to do a billion dollar deal or a hundred million dollar deal. Um, and in this, but the same thing goes for complexity. If it's a, if it's a vanilla utility scale deal, if there's ever such a thing that checks the box of a hundred million or 200 million of capital deployed, um, that doesn't require them to do a whole lot of um, uh, thinking where in the sense that they've done it before, they know the diligence, they know the players, they know what the IE report looks like, the environmental, et cetera. If they need to um, do diligence and sort of convince a credit committee or an investment committee um, or a tax committee of why it makes sense to add a whole bunch of other things, whether it's a battery, a fuel cell, a wind, a microgrid, whatever it is, all this complex technology, or why it makes sense to be in a variable um, uh, end market where there's maybe some merchant revenues or capacity sales, et cetera, et cetera. 
they just don't have the time to do that. It's a, it's a bang for the buck type of thing. So if you take them out of the equation, that's as uh, Melinda was saying, one less group of people and group of attorneys, group of consultants doing diligence that need to get comfortable with something that a developer like ourselves or some of the folks listening here are trying to innovate to try to create solutions for customers that, that meet a customer's need, not a bank's need. You know, and a similar trend, not just around innovation, but also around equality. If you look at things like low and moderate income communities for community solar, you know, the current regime and tax equity, you know, doesn't give any credit to that. And most likely would be, as you mentioned, looking at large scale utility opportunities to put hundreds of millions versus smaller community solar project that connects to LMI. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is there is an argument this is also going to help drive equality across the industry as well. I would tend to agree with that, if I may. Um, I think I think John or in, in some combination of John and Melinda were saying that this could improve the economics um, within the value chain. I might try to go a little controversial here, in the sense that I actually don't think that's the case. Um, if if any if it helps anybody out, it probably helps the customer, which is probably a good thing. But what I've seen, and I've been in the solar industry and renewables industry for over 15 years, and we've seen a lot of compression in pretty much every piece of the value chain. Um, whether it's the, the hardware itself, whether it's um, uh, finance, et cetera. And what, what I think we found is that this market is so hyper competitive. I don't believe that just because there's, we'll call it extra economics that are coming into the deal because you don't have to spend a million dollars to structure a tax equity deal. Um, I don't believe that developers get that million dollars for free. I think that there's, so, I mean, there's, I think John, you were saying there's over 200 people alone on this webinar and that's, I'm sure just scratching the surface of people paying attention to this issue. And certainly in our space, we operate in a hyper competitive environment. My guess is all of those, we'll call it economies from reduced transaction cost of tax equity, probably most of them, and, and most of it goes to the customer. Um, I don't believe developers will make a, a huge windfall for this. I'm guessing the next developer behind them will just bid lower um, to the to the utility or to the customer within this, the low income program. Um, and so I think ultimately it benefits the customers, which in terms of government policy is probably what they ultimately want to do. I doubt there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, politicians that have campaigned on let's make developers or let's make let's make wealthy people richer. Um, it's probably more like let's help out rate base of utilities. Let's help out the average citizen. Let's help out, um, you know, let's help create more of a clean economy. So I do believe that this will definitely help deploy more. We'll call it megawatts. I don't think it's going to make any of us richer. Um, that's just my personal opinion. Hmm. Shannon, you have some additional thoughts on uh, equity as well. Yeah, no, I, it just dawns on me as, as Joshua was talking. This is such an important priority for this administration. And you know, for those perhaps not in Washington, you may not have seen the level of emphasis that this administration has put on equality and especially energy equality, right? Um, they, they've put in and installed personnel at every federal agency to talk about environmental justice and, and equality issues. And so, you know, as we're examining this, and, and to Josh's point, you know, this, this really plays a benefit to everyone in every community, whether or not people are recipients of kind of utility scale solar or individual developer solar or community solar projects that are being held. And, and especially for public power and nonprofit entities, this is a game changer, right? Their ability to, to really transition and, and put resources behind clean energy technologies, whether it's carbon capture or solar or, or what have you, it is really crucial at this moment in time. And I think, especially when, you know, America has gone through so much you know, we are in an economic recovery period. We, we're starting to come out of a, a pandemic. We are looking ahead towards, you know, COP26 in the, the UN meeting in, in Glasgow next month. Where's America going to lead? And, and so I think this administration is really, really supportive of not only, you know, everything we can do to, to achieve the climate goals that they've set out, but also the equality goals that we've got to bring it. And frankly, America can lead in this. You know, we're seeing we're seeing equality and you know supply chain issues, you know, in, in places outside of America that are really troubling and troubling to a lot of you know members of Congress. So, you know, getting at that point, unleashing 100 percent direct pay will really enable us to make a huge difference for so many here. 
Yeah, thanks. I, I do want to transition next. So I've seen some questions come in. We will definitely get to those. So please an, an, ask your questions in the Q&A chat box um, and specifically talk about storage for a second and turn to Chris. Chris, you know, even if we just pass the ITC and storage gets an ITC um, and we don't pass direct pay, it's still going to be a challenging market for the storage uh, uh, developers to get a, a tax equity investment versus a, is, is uh, we talked earlier, sort of the vanilla solar space and tax 100% direct pay can really help accelerate that. First, can you talk a little bit about STEM does and then talk about the storage ITC? Sure, yeah, no, thanks so much, John, for uh, <clears throat> inviting me to be on this uh, terrific panel. Uh, very timely and, and important and uh, you know, thrilled to be on here with so many great you know, subject matter experts. Um, it's an exciting time here and, and chaotic time here in our nation's capital where you know, I reside. Um, there's four big issues that Congress is trying to deal with here. Actually, let me take a quick step back. Who, who is STEM? Uh, STEM is a smart energy storage solutions provider um, that leverages our artificial intelligence platform called Athena to optimize batteries on behalf of the customers. That uh, can mean you know, utility bill optimization, demand charge, you know, management savings, uh, participating in you know, grid services and realizing those revenue streams. And, we work primarily through the developer channel um, to um, develop projects uh, on behalf of our customers, primarily um, to date behind the meter we're CNI customers. Uh, but going forward, I think the front of the meter utility scale projects um, in a number of markets um, that we exist today and operate, but there's going to be a lot more if we get the, the standalone storage ITC, especially if we get it with direct pay. So I'll segue into kind of where we are today. Um, it's, like I said, a very kind of chaotic and tumultuous time in, in Washington. There's four big issues that Congress is trying to deal with before the end of the year. The first is the, the debt limit to make sure that we don't default on our, on our debts. And uh, Congress recently kind of kicked the can down the road on that until December 3rd. The second big issue at play is keeping the government funded and, and, and open. And again, Congress temporarily extended that through a, a CR, a continuing resolution, also until December 3rd. And why I mentioned those and why that's important is because that now creates a little bit of kind of breathing room and runway for uh, Congress to really focus on the president's domestic agenda. And, and there's two big bills um, that, um, that are relevant to that. One is called the, the BIB or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, also known as the Hard Infrastructure Bill. It has clean energy and some climate provisions in it, um, but more on the hard infrastructure, broadband, water, sewers, roads, bridges, et cetera. Uh, some EV stuff in there as well. And then the, the second big bill um, that they're focusing on is the uh, Build Back Better Act, also known as Reconciliation or the Human Infrastructure Bill. And that is the bill that has the, the clean energy tax title and got a, a standalone storage you know, investment tax credit. Uh, there's a little bit of, uh, of feuding, uh, intra-party squabbles taking place between kind of the two different factions of the Democratic caucus right now, the progressives versus kind of the more centrist and, and moderates. And the moderates would prefer to pass the, the bipartisan infrastructure or hard infrastructure bill ASAP. It's already passed the Senate with overwhelming support, 69 to 30 back in August. And the moderates were promised to vote on that by the speaker um, at, by the end of September. The progressive wing of the Democratic caucus um, would like to link that with the reconciliation bill. Uh, and fear that the, the moderates will vote for the, the, the infrastructure package, the bipartisan package, and not vote for reconciliation, which has you know, some more, if you will, controversial items, in, at least in, in their minds, with regard to corporate tax raises, some of the social programs and climate change, et, et cetera. So the bottom line is right now, we've got the next few weeks where leadership is really trying to negotiate uh, between the two different disparate uh, factions of the Democratic caucus and build consensus and try to get both of them passed by a self-imposed deadline of October 31st, so just about 18 days from now. And that date is significant because I think as Shannon said, um, the, the administration has placed a big emphasis and prioritization on clean energy and climate change. And the president would like to travel to the, the COP or the COP um, or council of parties uh, uh, event in Glasgow at the beginning of November with, with something in hand to demonstrate not only, you know, that uh, we're, we're to demonstrate that, you know, actions mean more than words, right? That's not just rhetoric. We actually have, you know, policy here in hand and we're going to help, you know, provide leadership, you know, to the rest of the world on that front. The questions that, you know, are at play is can they build consensus? Can the president show up at COP with something? And then, 
what about outside events, you know, inflation, the border crisis, global numbers, you know, how does all that impact, you know, over the next couple of weeks as we try to build this consent? Um, Carly, if you can go to the next slide, please. So what exactly is, is in the bill as it relates to direct pay and these standalone storage investment tax credits? So in the House Ways and Means Reconciliation drafts that will eventually be uh, compiled um, with a much broader reconciliation package from other committees, uh, they have a base credit of 6%, and then what they call a bonus credit of up to 30% ITC if you meet certain prevailing wages and apprenticeship requirements. Uh, it's for 10 years, so through the end of 2031. Uh, they also have a, a bonus or an adder of 10% um, if you can source domestic content. Um, this is, again, if you're electing to take direct pay, either uh, because you have tax appetite or you're going to you know, monetize it through sourcing tax equity. But as the reason we're here today, right, is to talk about direct pay. Um, and unfortunately, there is a direct pay provision um, in the Ways and Means draft, and we fully expect the Senate will have something similar, uh, if not exactly the same in, in their package when we get to that point in time. And through the end of 2023, um, developers, you know, projects can claim direct pay at 100% of the ITC value. Uh, and then, then in 20, beginning in 2024 through 2026, um, there's a requirement to actually meet domestic content. So whereas it's an adder if you take ITC, it becomes a requirement in 2024. And if you can't meet it, then you get 90% of the value. In 2025, if you don't, if you take uh, direct pay but can't meet domestic content, it's 85%. And then in 26, uh, 2026, through the end of the, the duration of the, of the credit, uh, so 2031 in this case, it's 0% if you can't meet domestic content. And one of the things we've been doing as an industry is um, not trying to oppose domestic content. We understand the intent behind, behind it and uh, the rationale, um, but the reality of the situation is we, we don't have enough you know, supply and domestic capacity right now to meet the broader carbonization goals and the acceleration of the clean energy transition that the administration is trying to is really trying to accelerate. So we're trying to you know, make sure that they understand we're not opposed to this, but maybe those dates are a little bit you know, too aggressive. And if the you know question is what does direct pay really do for the storage industry? As you know, a lot of things that Melinda and, and, and Shannon and, and Josh already said, um, it gets hand, dollars in hands of the developers quickly. Uh, you know, uh, it can uh, it can allow new market entrants and new markets literally to open up overnight. Um, so there are a number of tax exempt entities, think you know, rural electric co-ops in kind of the heartland of America and and munis and even Native American tribes that. You know, would like to do more renewable energy. You know, would like to do more storage, um, but it's it's costly, it's cumbersome, it's time consuming, um, and they have to you know as a tax exempt entity go out and, and source really uh, tax uh, equity, which again as we've said is kind of an illiquid market that's concentrated in a small number of very large banks. And so to date, they haven't really done a lot of these projects. But with direct pay and them able to just get those funds, you know almost immediately, um, it really would open up the market. I think Woodmac, you know, a very reputable uh, consultancy firm, et cetera, you know, their recent analysis showed that with just an ITC for storage, the total addressable market would increase 20 to 25% against their previous baselines. Now, they haven't modeled direct pay into that. They said that'll be in their next iteration in December. But when I was talking to them about it, they said it would be absolutely transformational with direct pay, you know, is allowed for not just storage, but also the, the other clean energy technologies. So, you know, wind and, um, and uh, solar, certainly. And the last thing that I would say is, you know, if we're going to truly be able to achieve um, you know, this administration's, you know, broader decarbonization goals, whether that's net zero by 2035 or 2040, or even, you know, 2050, pick, pick your date, um, there's not enough tax equity out there to absorb all these projects. You know, that supply, demand, and balance that, you know, has been referenced a couple of times. So direct pay, you know, really could be transformational, could catalyze the market, and, and really is, is, is a game changer. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, I have a question for you and Stacey before we sort of get to the current state of play and some action. You know, sure. under, or, I'm sorry, you and Shannon, under direct pay, the other benefits, the other tax benefits are not affected, right? They still have depreciation and other key uh, tax yeah. benefits involved, right? Yeah, that, that's correct. Absolutely right. They will not be impacted. And I think it gets back to uh, somebody made the comment, you know, with direct pay and, and ITC, et cetera, this isn't an either or, this is an and. And, you know, this is just going to really have a true kind of catalyzing effect on the marketplace. 
open up new markets, you know, overnight that might have, you know, projects that might have just been on the cusp and, you know, your the developer was waiting to, you know, for tax equity and, you know, projects were, you know, delayed because of that. Um, this this is truly going to be able to, uh, you know, get more shovel ready projects, you know, going and uh, and create jobs and, and help us, you know, get to uh, clean energy or not get to, but accelerate the clean energy transition. And a reminder, put your questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box, but we do have one in the chat box and I think I can answer. But basically with with um, with direct pay, it's just like the ITC where the actual customer could monetize it if they want to versus a third party who's doing the PPA. So as Chris said, it's a it's an and not an or. Um, yeah, that, that's been a, as I said, that's been a, a huge constraint for a lot of like tax exempt entities that I've, that I've mentioned to want to do these projects, but you know, are tax exempt and it's just, it can be very cumbersome for them. So direct pay unlocks that market. And it does coexist with the ITC. It's not too, again, it's not either or. Um, so if there's, without any other questions, I want to turn to Shannon for a second. And Chris talked about a little bit of the state of play and the, the, um, the uh, current uh, legislation that's in, uh, in Congress, you know, what, First of all, you know, what are the next couple of weeks look like and what actions can we take uh, as part of the industry to really drive change here and get Thank this over you. the goal line? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I might just uh, beg, your, beg your forgiveness to do a little deeper dive on what Chris said. No, um, please do. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't resist. You know, it's, it's my DC nature here. Um, so what we have is is pretty complicated and messy, um, no doubt about it. If you've been reading the papers or, or Twitter or anything else, um, you know you've got two very different legislative processes essentially operating under different rules, merging together in this single battle royale, if you will. So as Chris mentioned, you've got the infrastructure bill, which is really your classic infrastructure. It's got surface transportation, broadband, water infrastructure. You know, that was moving through Congress under what well, we have a traditional rules process. It received a lot of attention this summer when it was negotiated by a bar bipartisan group of senators. Senate passed that bill in early August with enough votes to actually overcome a, a Senate filibuster, which is 60 votes. Really, really important. That infrastructure bill includes a lot of the president's priorities, but certainly not all of them. And, and certainly as we look to some of the things that we've mentioned about equality, um, justice aspects, really, you know, a community focus, that's not where you're going to find a lot of it. So on the other hand, you've got the reconciliation process, which is a privileged process where a simple majority of 51 can pass a spending and tax measures bill following a budget resolution that basically instructs the process, right? So although direct pay as we know, enables energy infrastructure, it actually fits more squarely into that reconciliation bucket. That, you know, that privilege process fundamentally functions as a component of our tax policy. So that's where a lot of our advocacy efforts are focused right now. This is all, all coming down to a numbers game, frankly, the number of votes to be had and the top line budget number. As Chris mentioned, a lot of moderates on both sides of the fence, on the political fence, aren't comfortable signing on to a three and a half trillion dollar budget bill. While progressives are demanding a higher spend with critical priorities such as climate change and social expenditures, Republicans aren't going to go near this reconciliation bill to save their lives, right? This is, this is a Democrat run process. So the Democrats have to lock in every vote, especially on the Senate side. Remember, we're tied with the vice president being the final vote that puts Democrats over the edge here. And in the House, you've got a very similar dynamic. You've got, I think, 220 uh, Democrats to 212 with a, a couple vacancies, right? So this, this is a tough battle. You'll see this week, you know, more and more coming out as we're in this recess period that leadership ex is examining where to, um, I think that the terms that they're using right now are slash and trim. Um, which sounds a little bit more like vegetation management <laughs> and budget issues. But, um, and what, what we're focused on is that you've got kind of the, the climate change bucket of provisions currently being discussed. This includes, you know, tax um, incentives and direct pay for clean energy. You've got the clean electricity performance program, which is really geared at utilities. You've got a potential price on carbon that's being discussed, carbon border tax, it has its deficiencies, um, civilian climate corps, a few other things, right? Something in that bucket is going to be going to be eliminated, right? 
Um, Senator Manchin, who's been very public on his views uh, about some of the climate issues, is not a fan of the CEPP. Perhaps we have our answer there, right? So Senator Manchin, Senator Sinema, they're the you know kind of two popular holdouts, I'll say, um, on the Democratic Senate side. Um, but you know that the House has its own challenges as well. From a timeline perspective, again, leadership has set another deadline for the end of October ahead of the UN Climate Conference that we've referenced. So our unified advocacy on this issue is really, really crucial right now as lawmakers are making these difficult decisions weighing what should be in and what should be out. So, you know, Chris touched on some of the legislative momentum that we've had, and it's been phenomenal. Um, I, I've covered a number of energy issues over the years on, on Capitol Hill, and really this one, especially over the last six months, um, where we've really been out advocating on this issue, has, has really become a, a, a game changer. Um, we now have legislation in the House and Senate that are supportive of 100% direct pay, whereas at the beginning we were having conversations of, you know, why should we even consider direct pay? So we've made a, a world of difference already. Um, you've got legislative champions like Senator Carper, Senator Wyden, Congressman Blumenauer, all of them with you know, various differences in their, in their legislative intent, but supportive of 100% direct pay. So I think one of, the, one of the questions that I saw in the chat was, you know, does, does direct pay, you know, really apply to everyone? Um, and the answer is it depends, right? It depends in the end on, on what version of the legislation that's been sponsored by these members gets absorbed and, and accepted into a reconciliation package. It also depends on the number of uh, clean energy entities that are, you know, filling that tax equity pool as we discussed, right? Who else is going to get a, a PTC and ITC? All of that influences the, the total what we call score, um, how much these provisions cost. One of the great things about 100% direct pay, you know, we, we saw this in the markup uh, that Chairman Wyden did uh, in, back in May, scores very, very low, which means it doesn't cost <laughs> a lot to do a, a world uh, of, of difference here um, in terms of advocating and, and really advancing our clean energy goals. So um, we've had a lot of letters of support and we had 186 members sign on to a letter to leadership. Um, we, are, we are absolutely optimistic that 100% direct pay is going to make it in the end. Um, all of that to say, we have a long road to go. We have you know, essentially three weeks of uh, a lot of advocacy. And so, you know, John, you asked, what, what can folks do? How can they make a difference? Um, one thing, you know, reach out to us if you're interested. You've got the, the website uh, contact us page right in front of you. Um, we are uh, on Twitter, we're on LinkedIn, so please follow us. We're at Clean Energy. Uh, LinkedIn, it's the Partnership for Clean Energy Investment. Reach out if you've got questions too. We, we've put up some, some templates here that we've just designed. One of the things that you know, folks, you know, members on the Hill, really want to hear from their constituents on, on what matters, right? So if this, is, if this is something that is rising to your, your top priorities, we would love to help you, you know, draft a letter to your member of Congress, whether as an individual or as a part of your, your companies that you're representing, and really tell your story. Um, have them understand if you, if you can't kind of, you know, be here in Washington or, or meet with them individually, have them see in, in black and white and, and request that they respond back to you, right? This is a way to elevate our engagement and also let them see that this is not just, you know, a handful of, of companies or, you know, e even kind of the usual, you know, trade associations that they hear from. They want to hear from the heartland. So hopefully that helps, John. No, Shannon, that's great. And I'm going to drive this a little harder. There's a few questions I'll get to here in a second. But the reality is, you know, we're going to send out these letters. We're going to put the link out there so you can reach out to the Partnership for Clean Energy Investment and get help. But the reality is this isn't about where your company's headquartered. It could matter if you're in Tucson, Arizona, for instance. But think about where you have projects, where you have employees, and think about your footprint. Most folks on this call don't have policy shops or have very, very limited policy shops to do this work. But it shouldn't take that much effort to, to put your name on a letterhead and, and Shannon and team will help you send this in. That impact can be significant. Uh, if you're willing to even step up further and lend your voice with a, a meeting with staff or a phone call, especially in targeted states like West Virginia and Arizona, I'm going to say it again, West Virginia and Arizona, West Virginia and Arizona, we can get this uh, over the goal line 
and help drive us forward. Are there any, by the way, any other key states, Shannon, you think are important for folks? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of states that we typically hear from in the, the climate change and clean energy conversation are, you know, the Northeast and California, right? There's a whole swath of our country that aren't those states, right? I, I think it's really important, you know, as you expressed, no matter where you are, your projects help so many. And so, you know, let's let's have a chat. Let's look at your footprint. Let's see where you've got potential projects that, that could be on the line here, right? Where could direct pay have really put a project in the ground, put people to work and benefited, you know, number of, of customers with clean energy? Think about yeah, it now. Absolutely. I mean, one of the things we did, I mean, we're in 90 different states at Clean Capital, so we were able to sort of identify where those are and, and have an impact um, with those, those folks. So, uh, please go to the partnership for clean energy investment.com. You can always reach out to us at clean capital. Carly will send around more information to drive some action. Um, there are a few just remaining questions. I think it's important to note to folks that when a piece of legislation passed, there's still rules that need to be put together on how this all works. So all of the details are not hundred percent defined just because it's in the legislation. So this will end up, if it passes, when it passes, let's be positive. When it passes, it goes to uh, goes to the administration, and then, for instance, the IRS will structure the rules that this will live within. So there, there will be a period of uncertainty post the passing of what things look like. So some of your questions around uh, sequestration, for instance, or like what are the mechanics compared to 1603, we just don't actually know yet until those things are driven by the the bureaucrats who will, who will wrestle with it. Uh, I do want to point what Todd said. Todd Glass specifically made a really important point where. You know, there's going to be a shift in people will still be providing tax equity for sure, but they'll also be providing debt in a new, aggressive, innovative way. Um, and, and I think that will be an exciting part to the market and really provide opportunities. There's so many benefits that direct pay brings to our uh, our industry. It's just critical. We're at that critical moment that it has to happen. Uh, this is probably like a once in a generational climate set of uh legislation that, that needs to get done and we it's up to us as the industry to push forward because as someone asked about opposition there's not a whole lot of opposition to direct pay itself there's opposition to driving clean energy and that opposition has been entrenched for decades you know it's up to us as the industry to push back on that and lend our voices to the conversation so thank you to everyone for joining um as thank you to all the panelists for being part of this i'm not sure if anyone's got any uh, any final words? I'm just going to say, take some action. We need to do it today. Then I, I would just say to kind of, you know, uh, you know, conclude everything again, call to action, you know, sign up, go to the website, you know, if you're willing to lend your voice to staff meetings, you know, uh, I'm a kind of eternal optimist, right. And, uh, you know, I'm a Mets fan, so I gotta be that way. Day again, and a Bills fan. Um, but I do think that, you know, the leadership of the, the House, the Senate, and certainly the White House, um, it's a deft and they have to, you know, thread the needle. But I think they, as you just said, recognize this is truly a generational opportunity and they're going to put the full court press on. But they need to hear from their constituencies. They need to hear from you know, people that are waiting to do and develop, you know, projects in terms of in their respective congressional districts and their states. So can't underscore enough how important that is. We, we have projects, you know, that we're talking with developers, probably some of the folks on this phone that are just kind of paralyzed right now while we're waiting for this to hopefully get across the finish line. So, you know, do everything you, you can to advocate for it because it is absolutely critical and would be a game changer. Absolutely. So, oh, go ahead, Shannon. Sorry, please. No, sorry, John. Uh, I was actually just trying to respond to the 1603 questions. Yeah. I dropped a, a link into the chat, actually. Uh, we've done a, a fact sheet on 1603, but as John noted, um, you know, we there are some strong comparisons to 1603, and, and frankly, 1603 was a success story, right? It, it proved that for essentially every federal dollar uh, that went into that program, you had about two to $3 of private capital that uh, expanded on, on clean energy development. So. Um, there's a lot of great stuff in there, you know, in terms of the, the specifics, as John noted, there's a lot to be hashed out when this comes out of the, uh, the rents with the, the federal agencies. Um, but one of the, one of the advantages of direct pay is that you essentially have the system already set up, right? There's not, 
There's not a new agency. There's not a new bureaucracy that needs to be created. Um, it will really be one of the more efficient things that we can do to impact clean energy development in this country. So I'm happy to talk offline about 1603 or, or any of these other issues. Yeah, and it's important to note, as I said, the mechanics are still being worked out. So I know there's some questions about that, but you know, I think uh, I think Shannon's fact sheet addresses some of it, and the reality is some of it we're just we won't know until this actually passes, and and, and uh, the administration can work through it. But their their overall intent is to make this efficient, efficient, and and really try to drive the market forward. Um, well, thank you to everyone for joining today. We will email around the links. We'll email around uh, uh, the information that we talked about. Please reach out to us at Clean Capital uh, or to Shannon as well. And please, this is the moment that we all have to take action to help move our industry forward. So please do something um, as soon as possible. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Tom. Thanks,